This is episode number 35 featuring artist Amory Bowling. Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast from Plein Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. In the Plein Air Podcast, we dive deeply into the world of outdoor painting, often called Plein Air painting, which is a French term, essentially meaning outdoors. The French pronounce it Plein Air. Others say Plein Air, but it doesn't matter how you say it. What matters is there's a huge movement of artists around the world Going Outdoors to Paint, and this show is all about that movement. This week's podcast is brought to you by the Plein Air Convention, the largest gathering of plein air artists in history. It's coming April in San Diego. You can learn more at pleinairconvention.com. My desire is to see more people fall in love with plein air painting because, well, it's just a lot of fun. It's the new golf. You can help by sharing this podcast with your friends and take them out painting. That's what's going to make them fall in love. You have feedback? Send me a note, eric at plenairmagazine.com. The interview is also brought to you by the Plen Air Salon Art Competition, a chance to win cash prizes, national exposure, the cover of Plen Air Magazine, and you can build your brand as an artist. Learn more at plenairsalon.com. Well, let's get right to our interview with artist Amory Bowling. Well, we have Amory Bowling on the line. Amory, how are you today? I'm doing great, thanks. And you are, are you, you're in your uh, gallery in Scottsdale, is that right? I am. I am. I am in my gallery in front of, kind of in my little studio area by the painting and the easel sandwiched in here. So, so <laughs> for the cozy. people, the people who might not yet know about you, uh, tell people what you do, what your specialty is. Um, I, I definitely focus a lot on painting the Grand Canyon, the, the Western landscape. I kind of like stuff that has a little bit more drama. You, you probably won't see a lot of my work featuring rolling hills and puffy clouds. I'll probably seek out rocks and wonky trees. That, that seems to be more of an interesting subject matter for me. So, yeah, wonky. those canyons do it. Wonky. I, maybe that's not the right word. That's a good word. I like that word. I'm going to make up my own today. vocabulary. I'm going to make yeah, a point. Uh, Sometime today, use the word wonky. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I uh, uh, we're going to get into your um, in, in, into the whole thing here in a second. But I'm just curious about you, why do you own a gallery? Because um, that seems to me like that would pin you down to some extent. Yeah, I think it, there's something that I do try to be conscious of because I, I don't think my goal as an artist is to be like, the the commercial like I have my gallery the Amory brand in different locations I think part a big part of it you know it was serving two problems I had and one was like I really wanted to get out of my house and paint somewhere else because I wasn't being as productive at home because there was a lot of distractions around the other problem I had is you know I, I wanted to be able to bring in more money because I didn't feel like the galleries I had at the time were representing me in a way I wanted to be represented which is fair because there's especially when you're a nude artist, there's so much competition in a gallery for wall space and they can only do so much. So sometimes you have to be your biggest supporter. And, you know, it was a leap of faith to open up a gallery. It's pretty scary and it's also really rewarding. So I get better work done. I get to meet my clients and I, I make sure I still have representation at other galleries so I don't get too, you know, in my own head having my own gallery. So I think that helps balance me out. Well, you said you had distractions at home, but you've got people wandering into the gallery randomly on the street. You're on the main street there in Scottsdale. So oh yes, <laughs> that seems like that would be more distraction. Sometimes. I mean, you, you get some colorful characters when you have a, a public business and you are easy to find. It's not hard for, you know, any person to say, I'm going to go visit Amory today. So it's, you know, for the most part, the people who do visit you, it's not like that frequent. I have good banks of painting time. And when I do get distracted, it's it's still like on topic. It's about art. It's not like, you know, doing the dishes at home. Like it's, it's such a different shift of mind. So it's someone who comes in, says they like your work. Maybe they buy something, which is great. And then you go back to painting. You so. just totally blew my image of you. I can't imagine you doing dishes. <laughs> 
Oh, ironing. I really like ironing. I find that very rewarding. Yeah, but listen, I I've got a couple of shirts that I need to have ironed. <laughs> so that sounded very sexist. I apologize. I, I labeled myself there, so you're fine. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, I, I, I want to probe this just a little bit because it's interesting to me. Um, you have a very unique perspective because you're an artist who owns a gallery and yeah. you're an artist who was in other galleries before you started your own gallery. So I think what I'd like you to do is to touch base on some things that maybe you have figured out or learned that other artists need to know about the perspective of a gallery owner. Yeah. Um, not so much the gallery owner as an artist, because it's a lot of most people probably won't start their own yeah. galleries, but to help them understand the kinds of things that you think about as a gallery owner, as it relates to other artists, because you do carry um, other artists in your gallery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have uh, Amy Carnes and Matt Strebens in here. I mean, not like a massive amount of work, and I'm not able to promote them like a, a, diff, a, a probably more of a legit gallery can. But you do get, you know, a different perspective on things when you go on the other side of the door and you're, you're working, you know, my neighbors are gallery owners. I work with them on the, you know, you'll see, meet them in the gallery associations and such. So what I've, I've learned and I'll try cause you know, every now and then an artist will come in and they'll ask for representation and you try to give them advice because you know, it's important. Like, I mean, pounding the pavement is great, but a lot of artists will just like hit every gallery on main street and just, wait until someone says, we'll take your work. You really need to do your homework. Like you, you want to find a gallery. Like sometimes they think that, oh, this gallery has a lot of Grand Canyon work. Surely they'll take my Grand Canyon work. So the galleries, sometimes they want a little bit of variety. I'm like, you have Gallery of Russia who will probably bring in, you know, Russian artist works, but they're not trying to have all the paintings look exactly alike. They want to reach a big demographic. So you know, if you have Grand Canyon works, maybe you want to go into a fine art landscape gallery that does not quite have that niche filled. Um, so that that's a problem I see. Like you'll have someone doing modern sculpture art and ask for representation at my gallery. And I'm like, did you not do any homework? I'm like, I'm a studio gallery. I don't represent that stuff. And it's just wasting my time in theirs. Well, as you know, I teach uh, art marketing and I have yeah. uh, whole segments on in some of my boot camp DVDs on how to get into galleries and so on. And one of the things that I have heard continually <laughs> from gallery owners, um, it sounds like your perspective might be a little bit different, but it's like, don't just show up with paintings oh, no, uh, that's awful. and, and, and <laughs> interrupt my day and uh, say, hey, gee, I want to. I want I've I want to be that. in your gallery because that can actually backfire and work against you. Is that Sometimes correct? they won't take well oh yeah, like cause like you have stuff to do and you have clients coming in and I've had people just say, bring they just bring their portfolio and line stuff up on the wall and like they don't plan on leaving until you say yes. And it's it's frustrating. It's like they, they want to be, you know, confident, which is great, but at the same time it's misplaced. <laughs> So you want to be polite, you want to be smart about it, you want to be, you know, ambitious but respectful of the gallery owner. Yeah, I've heard I've heard stories of of artists coming in and actually interrupting a dialogue that's going on with somebody who's in the process uh, of buying yeah. a painting. <laughs> I I don't know if I've had that. I've had people like wanting to visit and then someone would come and make a sale. They wouldn't quite want to leave. So I don't really. So it, you do have some awkward moments, yeah. but any other lessons for artists in terms of your perspective um, of being a gallery owner? I think the other advice I've given is, you know, when an artist does get into a gallery, the next thing they want is their solo exhibitions. They want more representation. They want advertising, and I think, you know, from the gallery owner's point of view, and this is, you know, my it is mine's probably not general. It's just an opinion. But I, I find that if you're an artist in a gallery, you know, probably 50, 60, whatever commission rate you set up goes to the gallery and the other half goes to you. If you're not making any sales, if you don't have a lot of history with sales or other galleries or kind of notoriety. It's going to be hard to convince that gallery to give you a solo show because that's like for them, if they have an artist, they know will sell. They're going to and they have like maybe 12 weeks a year to have a solo show, they're probably going to give it to the one they know that is going to bring in money right. and maybe not to the new artist. So 
your job is to brand yourself as much as you can so that you can ask for a show and say, well, I've gotten these awards, I make these sales, so this is a good investment for you. Or maybe you're giving them such good work, you're actually making sales at the gallery that will make them want to give you a solo show. But I think a lot of artists expect the galleries just give them a show and it's going to make it. And the gallery's like, well, well we're not going to make any money off this show. Well, that really speaks That really week. speaks to the power of branding because um, if somebody walks in and you don't know their name and you don't know their work, um, and they want to or, show. or if they send you an email and try to schedule a time to discuss it with you, which is, of course, probably the better way. Yeah, that would be uh, better. I, 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 then, the, you know, not having a brand is detrimental to them. And, and building a brand is, is really critical for every and artist. You, anybody can build a brand. Like, be involved. Like, go to those, like, you know, the plein air convention. Go to workshops. Get to know artists. Be involved in plein air shows. Like, try to get into magazines. All that stuff, you don't need a gallery to do. Right. But that will make them like you more. Right. So. Well, let's move from the gallery world <laughs> okay. to the world of uh, Amory the painter. Oh, so you're a relatively, uh, relatively young person. Um, yeah, relatively. <laughs> and um, yet you started pretty young as a painter. I did. I, I, I loved painting from the get go. Um, I was pretty much taking workshops at Scott Art School when I was 16. And I took them pretty regularly. I mean, outside of school, I would try, you know, spring breaks and summers. And I really enjoyed it. I found that to be a place where I fit in and everyone was as interested in art as I was. So it's so, just a comfortable place. So who were some of the people you took workshops from at early stages? Well, the, at first, the first workshop I took was Shoefly, Bob Shoefelt. And I, I might, we might have discussed this. Uh, you know, a while back, but that was the class I went to where it was my first nude model class. So that was, that was interesting. And it was like all males, no girls. So, and it was just all pencil drawing. Um, after that, I, I took some classes with, um, Joseph LaRusso, definitely like Ray, Ray Roberts and Peggy when they were living in Arizona many, many years ago, I took some of their workshops um, I went on to really enjoy classes with uh, Joseph Mendez, and uh, I took some Scott Christensen stuff. I learned a lot from them. So I think, you know, those teachers were really influential because I felt like they were, what they taught you was correct. You know, they, they were on the right path. They weren't trying to, you know, there's, there's this common thread they all had that make you a good painter. And like, you know, Mendez wasn't going to let you get away with anything. Like, if you failed, he'd let you know. And <laughs> I think that helped me learn faster. <laughs> Joe so. Joe doesn't mince words, right? No, Joe is very, like, <laughs> He definitely probably takes after his Sergei Bongard teacher he had in the past. You know, he's a tough cookie. So you said there was a common thread. Well, like, what, I think what is the common thread? They They teach, like, those, like, there's these main ideas of an art that they all kind of appreciate i mean rules can be broken as long as you know what they are but like you know shadows and your shadows lights and your lights you know good composition a lot of that stuff you hear from the edgar Payne book um you know drawing like plain theory like a good artist they all are aware of these concepts that help build a good painting and like i think you can kind of judge does this teacher know what they're doing by do they know these things so a lot of the plein air teachers do. And I think that like if they start, I, I want to go to a teacher that they may have different styles and different approaches, but they're going to make sure you get your values right and your line right and your composition right. They're all going to agree on that. So I like that. So you, you said that you're, com you're commonly known as a um, Grand Canyon painter, and clearly you have a lot of Really interesting experience if you look at the paintings on your website, which is amorybowling.com, B-O-H-L-I-N-G. Um, you, you know, you have a lot of figure work, uh, horses, et cetera. Yeah. But you do, you do ha have kind of become known as a Grand Canyon painter. Do you spend uh, a lot of time doing plein air at the Grand Canyon? Do you use photographs? What's your story there? I mean, that's always a hard question to answer because I think in my head I definitely don't paint there enough 
and it, it is hard because, you know, being at the gallery, I can't like during high season or any kind of season just run down there because I need to be here. And I also have, it's the studio work that I primarily sell, but you know, I have the Grand Canyon Celebration of Art. I get to participate in that show in September like I have in the past. And I get, you know, a good bank of time to paint outside. And I'll try to make up, make my own trips out there when I can and stay for a couple days and paint. And that's kind of how I get my material. So then I bring it back in the studio. And that's when I kind of use the plein air study and create a studio piece from it using, using a photograph. Because I can't, I don't have... I don't have eidetic memory. I wish that would be pretty awesome. All right. So you're taking, uh, you're taking a study, which is giving you the essence of the light and the color and the, and the yeah, form the mood, everything and, comes from that study. And then you're, uh, you're using the photograph to kind of fill in the detail. Yeah. Photograph is what's most important for me in the photograph is the drawing, you know, maybe some like what's going on with the shadows, but I, I don't rely on the photo so much for like what the color is like, Obviously that that tree is green over orange, but you know, from there, I know I have, you, you kind of try to remember when you were there and go off of your study for the colors and the atmosphere. So I always wanted to paint the Grand Canyon and I, uh, I took the kids to the Grand Canyon for spring break a couple of years ago. And I was, I didn't take my oils. I took gouache because I knew I wouldn't be able to carry the oils around on vacation very easily. And <laughs> I slipped out in the morning and, and did paintings of the Grand Canyon. And I found it to be the most difficult thing I think I've ever painted because yeah. there's so much information there. When I think, and I know like some of the reasons I think why I picked these like complicated subjects is like I, I almost wonder if I, I have like an ADD on the canvas. Like if it's just a blank space, it drives me nuts and I, I lose interest. Like I can't just do a smooth space. I, I have a lot of respect for some of those Sargent paintings. They'll just be like a blank wall because like I want so badly to fill in every corner. And it helps because the canyon is kind of like detail all over the place and lots of little, for me, it's a lot of little brush strokes. So it, it works well, I think, with my personality type. I mean, you can also, like, if you ever go out and paint the canyon on your own, you can break it down into simpler subjects. You don't have to paint the whole canyon. It might just be, you know, duck on a rock, a little outcropping, you know, maybe a, a rock vignette. I think you just do pieces of it. But it's also, like, not easy to have a preconceived notion of what the canyon is because when we see a tree, we think stick on green ball. And the Grand Canyon is, like, it's so abstract you don't really have to fight with whatever your brain wants it to be. It, it start, it's like starting fresh. You, you don't have like the Grand Canyon is always this color and that color and this shape. So I think that helps if that makes any sense. So is the, the Canyon, is, is it your muse? I mean, it, it seems like oh, for sure. I, I know that it's got endless amounts of subject matter, but it, it also seems like unless you're really, really into it, you'd, kind of want to move on to other things and you do yeah. from time to time but oh i do but um i, I saw a, a, just a beautiful uh, seascape recently <laughs> that you did but uh you you do primarily kind of get pigeonholed into the grand canyon painter thing so what is it about the canyon that that really turns you on i mean i i think i kind of had an idea that yeah you're probably going to be known for something as an artist but, and I, I think what was important to me is if I was going to be recognized as painting something, well, darn it, I better like it. So I didn't really rush into, you know, painting. I took my time to figure out what I liked painting, what I enjoyed. And, you know, the Grand Canyon was something I, I went there and I painted and I'm like, this place is awesome. And I haven't lost interest yet because there's just so much like, you know, the stories and the people and like you have... You know, you have the river scenes and you have like the meadows of Indian gardens. It's just like this limitless supply of inspiration and it, it just, it doesn't end. So I don't think if I'm pigeonholed for the Grand Canyon, I'd be thrilled. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't have a problem with that at all. And of course, when I need a break, I'm going to paint what I want to paint. I will mix it up a bit. Maybe it'll sell. Maybe it won't. But so how know, much, gotta, how much plein air painting do you do? Um, oh gosh, I'm trying to think. Well, when I, 
I travel, I do painting. So maybe like a couple days a month, I probably am doing a painting from life or outside. I mean, not always my ideal situation. I figure like those solid trips are probably like maybe three weeks a year where it's just only plein air painting. Right. So yeah, more would be even better. Uh, you didn't start out as a plein air painter. You started out as a studio painter. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's kind of a strange thing. So I went to, um, you know, in high school and stuff, I was definitely like bust out that National Geographic and draw that girl with the light blue eyes. I'm like, it was, you know, a lot of kids did it back then. And then, um, oh gosh, I went to college and I did, you know, your traditional college stuff and studio works at the Scottsdale Art School. And then one year I studied in France and that school was actually a plein air, a very strict plein air school. Like they did no lights in the studio. You painted from natural light. They had all the North face and, you know, every day you'd go painting outside except for Friday and then you'd work in the studio. But I don't think I appreciated that it was plein air painting. I didn't really know the term that well, but we, we did that the whole school year. And then when I got back home, I went right back into painting from photos because that seemed like that was the best way to go. So, you know, after that, I kind of had a wake up call from, I think it was Mendez and it's just like, showed me how wrong the photos were. And I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So well, I learned talk, a lot. Talk to the people who might not know that. Um, he, because there are people listening to this who are new to painting, who have never painted, people who are on the journey trying to figure it out, as well as people who are established. But how does a photo lie? Well, like... It, it, the camera can only capture so much information, I think. So it's going to focus on the dark. So it's going to focus on the lights. And oftentimes you and or even whoever's developing them can like skew the colors, what settings you have it on. So you'll end up with something like people don't your, develop pictures anymore. Didn't you know no, that's true? <laughs> but your computer screen settings can affect the way it looks. So you end up with like a photo that has like the tree branch and the tree might be completely black. And then your your sunset is like bleached out and you end up with this painting. And that's not what the reality was. Like I think if you took that person and held that photo they took up next to that sunset, it would make them scared to believe in that photograph. And, and I think that teacher did that for me because I was I was painting something. I don't know if I had a camera there. or I had a picture of something similar. And he pointed out to me is like, look at how look at that dark thing on that leaf. Do you see how much color and light there is? And then like. He showed me in the photo, I'm like, that's completely black. And it really illustrated how wrong the photo was from what I was painting. And it was kind of like, oh, my gosh, this is awful. I, I had no idea. And then, like, I, after that, it was just like I just did not believe the photos anymore. You know, I've never heard anybody say that, but I think that's really a great idea for everybody to do really when you're first starting yeah. to paint is to take a picture, print it out, and then go outside and, and compare the two. I think You'd probably be surprised. Idea. It just can't. It's limited. It's not the human eye. The human eye is so much better. How do you paint a sunset? Because sunsets are so fleeting. You know, you have... You have... Um, I don't know, minutes of, <laughs> of that great warm afternoon light just as things are, you know, the sun's going down. What's your process for capturing a sunset? Oh, gosh. Well, they, I think they're easier than sunrises. I feel like that light is so much quicker. Well, um, plus getting out of bed that early is, is yeah. the toughest part, right? Yeah, it's not, it's not pleasant. But um, I think for sunsets, you know, you want to be – for me, painting at the canyon, because it is, you know, it is a complicated subject, like painting something often enough kind of puts it into your memory a little bit. So I know I'm familiar with how the light falls across the canyon. So like if if the light comes and goes, I can kind of still remember where it was. You also want to try and work fast. You can have some colors pre-mixed beforehand or as the sun's kind of getting low so you kind of have an idea of what the colors are doing so you can have that to pull from to make it go faster do your drawing work first that helps sketch 
try to be prepared and work fast. And then you might have to come back another day and finish it. You know, work small. That also helps. But so, so you lay out, you, you'll kind of sketch out your entire scene. And then like, uh, during that 15 or 20 minute period of time, you're basically just laying in color. Like what up here would be like for me at the Grand Canyon, like let's say during the celebration of art, I might arrive at my location around 334, set things up, kind of get a sketch. You know, you're already kind of seeing what's going on with the shadow and lights, though it will be a lot better and more intense. Um, so I'm going to do my pre-sketch. I might like as the sun gets lower, have some general puddles of color mixed up. One for maybe the, the fiery orange and the rocks and like a color for the, the blue shadows in the foreground, maybe a lighter, duller one for the background. And then I kind of block in the shadows and lights first. And then I start working on the details once I've got those shapes established. Because you kind of want to get that information down as quick as you can because that's what's going to move. And then you have to be true. As the sun leaves, you have to be true to those shadows and light settings you already set up, those, those patterns. So detail work later, block it in first, and work fast. <laughs> yeah, so what's the key to making a sunset believable? Because, you, you know, when you paint the colors that you see, um, sometimes it can appear very garish. Yeah, and it is a bit garish. I mean, you want to, you know, I, I think a lot of people tend to, um, you know, wash it out. I mean, you, you do want to keep your your shadows a, a good color and your lights like a good color. You don't want it so pale that you don't have saturation. So at least with the canyon, I think it's about saturation. You want to be like, and you know, think of complementary colors. Like you can use that to your advantage. Like a little bit of that green shrubbery will play nicely with the orange rock. And then you got that brick red and then the blues. So I could say that I do have garish canyon paintings because it's blue and orange. I'm like looking at it right now. It looks very blue and orange. But I think that is kind of a sunset value, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, maybe I've been doing it wrong. Well, we'll, we'll be the judge of that. <laughs> All right. Everybody needs to go to Amory's website and look at her sunset paintings and see if she's doing it wrong. I don't <laughs> think so. Um, so let's talk about the journey for the painter, because there are a lot of painters, as I said, that are um, kind of trying to figure this all out. Um, mm -hmm. How much teaching are you doing? And uh, what is the process that you kind of put people through? Um, I, I don't know if I have a regular, you know, I do 12 workshops a year. It, it doesn't tend to be that much, but I do a lot, a lot of my classes are with the Scottsdale Artist School and on occasion I do private lessons in the studio. Um, so I think I have a class coming up in March that is like, you know, it's a good beginner's class. It's like kind of going to teach you about how the photos lie and getting good habits set up. And, you know, later in the year I'm going to be teaching uh, on, two on-location workshops, one in Canyon de Chez and one in around Montezuma's castle. So I think those places are great. Canyon de Chez is kind of like a simplified Grand Canyon. So I think that'll be easier for people to kind of catch on to. Right. And I learned some great lessons when I painted there about um, how atmosphere affects the intensity of color as it recedes. So you can get some good little things, but you know, uh, I don't know if that answered your question, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, in, in terms of, um, education what mm -hmm. what do you want to share with the early student in terms of the things that they should be doing to um, kind of get through the basics understand what they should be doing is there is there any particular um, process that you recommend to people work on sketching um, have a plan before you start any painting do a little you know four by four around that size sketch of your work before you do it understand your values you know learn the difference between shadows and lights everything in your shadows need to be darker than everything in your light keep those separated sometimes you can even pre-mix colors to make sure you keep them clean like shadows here and lights here um you know read some good books like the edgar Payne's 
I was it the comp, outdoor comp, I never remember the name of this book, but the composition of outdoor painting. He has a good book on that stuff. So I'd appreciate good composition, like how you can make it more interesting by making a mountain, you know, larger than the foreground, balancing things out, getting good instructors, like try to talk to other students to find out who's a good teacher. And sometimes the best teachers are the ones some students say they don't like because they were too tough. So you have to keep an open mind about that too. Well, but, I think that, that in some ways can be really critical. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I can only draw on my own experience, but some of the best teachers that I've ever had were some of the biggest, uh, I wouldn't say jerks, but jerks is probably <laughs> a little bit much, but, but they, they, you know, yeah. rather than walking around and telling everybody, Oh, that's nice. You're doing a beautiful yeah. job. Keep going. Uh, they would, say, listen, you know, here's why this doesn't work. Or some, mm-hmm. some of them were a little less tactful and here's why you're screwing up. But those are the lessons. Those are the best ones. Yeah. And, and you so, want to get good. You, you know, somebody who's learning needs to have a little bit of a thick skin and, and understand that mm-hmm. don't get invested so much in your, in what you're doing. You're there to learn. You're not there to do a good painting. I think you and I talked about when you were down here, um, mm-hmm. shooting uh, your new video, which is coming out soon. Um, <laughs> you you were talking about students who come to workshops and they focus on wanting to do a good painting rather yeah. than learning the right lessons. That happens a lot. Yeah. Or students who don't, like another problem I have is like someone is really wanting to get better and improve as an artist, but they s- don't sign up for these workshops because they think, they're not good enough to take. And I'm like, how are you ever going to learn? I mean, I'm not saying go sign up for, you know, the most advanced class you can find, but there's a lot of great starter workshops that, and the teachers, for the most part, if you just talk to a teacher, they'll probably be happy to have you. Like a lot of it is one-on-one basis. So I think don't let your, don't be self-conscious about taking a good workshop. Like that's how you're going to get good and get good fast is these classes. You're going to meet friends. You're going to meet the teachers. You're going to learn so much more. And I it always feel bad when someone thinks they can't take a class because they don't think they're good enough. So I think that holds a lot of people back. So what is the opus for you? What What is the, the big um, career-changing, life-changing thing that you want to do in your painting career that you haven't done yet? Um, well, I think... Trying, trying to work on a larger scale, having that perfect painting. And, you know, it, it is hard because, like, I'll, I'll set little goals for myself. And I'm not always sure, like, you know, it, it, there, there'll be a new goal once I meet that one. So it almost seems like that opus just continues. Like, you know, when I first started out, the opus was, you know, getting into Southwest Arts 21 out of 31. I'm like, now I've made it. And then you realize it's still a long ways to go. I think at the moment, there are definitely some shows I would love to be in that feature like Western art. You have like the Prix de West and then the shows that are at the Autry that are just really impressive. But I'm sure if if one day I'm fortunate enough to get into those shows, I'll probably set a new goal, like well, stay know, in the show it, or it, paint I don't know if you were there at this moment in time, but when Kurt Walters was on stage at the plein air convention, mm-hmm. he said that he applied for Prix de West I think he said 19 years in a row and he get rejected it's, he's 19 so times, good but he too. kept, it's like, he kept what were they thinking? Yeah. We look yeah. at him and we say, Oh, he's probably always been there. So yeah, it's, it's a process. It is, you know, it's, and you know, you can't, and you, you get rejected so much in art. Like there's shows you get into, there's shows you don't get into, there's awards you win. You're like, there's no way I should have won that award. So sometimes it swings in your favor. Sometimes it doesn't, you can't let it, you, you get, better I think when you're younger it it affects you a little bit more and then you kind of see the big picture and you're like okay sometimes it's good sometimes it's not good doesn't mean I'm not a good artist doesn't mean you shouldn't keep trying well your self-talk is pretty critical isn't it yes and then having you know a good support network you need people like there are days and you're like what am I doing and it's nice to have someone around you like oh you're doing great keep it up so (laughs) that is super important well you are doing great keep it up thanks (laughs) thanks <laughs> I won't quit I'll keep the gallery open so what do you do to uh today to try to improve yourself are are you studying uh continuing study with other people do you 
pretty much stick with yourself at this point? How do you kind of move yourself to the next level? Well, I still, I love like taking workshops. I, I don't always get to take them because trying to find, you know, someone I want to take a class from that fits into when I'm in town. Uh, last year, or this time, I guess this year, last spring, I took Susan Leone's class and that was Susan Lyon. And it was wonderful. You know, you, I learned a lot from those things. Um, you know, even, even just going out and painting with other artists, you learn a lot from that too. Cause like, I'll have a friend come up and, you know, maybe give me some unsolicited advice, but then darn it, they're right. It's like, if you just did this, it would be so much better. You're like, Oh my gosh. Yes. Oh, why did I do that? And so, that helps you grow too. So when you're painting with other artists, you know, the, the temptation that I, I fight is, you know, I'll take, I, I have to get away from my canvas once in a while, mm -hmm. which I think everybody needs to do, oh, yes. but, um, you start peeking at what they're doing and then, you know, you go, Oh, that's better than what I'm doing. You come <laughs> back and start messing with what you're doing. Do you do yeah. that? Um, I, I do feel like, you know, the, some of the people I go painting with definitely paint outside a lot more than I do. So they're more on top of it. Like it's, it's like a habit riding a bike. Well, no, maybe not riding a bike. Cause then it would always be there, but people who paint outside all the time for their bread and butter and all that stuff are just so spot on. I'm a lot, I'm not as on point with them. So I do look around, I'm like, Ooh, okay. Not looking so good over on my end. But they're also able to give me a lot of help and make it look better. So I appreciate that. Or maybe I get an idea of where to paint next time. I'm like, that's a good spot. I didn't think of that. Well, I think that surrounding yourself with people who are better than you is always a good idea. Yeah. It's, um, it, it's fun to go paint with your buddies mm -hmm. uh, who are not necessarily better than you. And that's okay, too. But um, because you you then can give them tips and pointers and help them if yeah. they're willing. But at the same time, we all need that. We all need somebody who's um, who's going to help us see see things differently, open our eyes. Yeah, I think it's also important. Like if you do paint with another artist, um, you know, you kind of want to have maybe your own cars and someone who wants who who likes painting as much as you do, because like. It, it, it can be tricky if you share a ride with someone who probably likes to paint a little bit, but not that much. So then <laughs> they'll just stand there and be very frustrated until it's time to go home. So I, like, I was, do you want to match that up? <laughs> you mentioned that I, I was, uh, I, I spent the, uh, a few days painting with Joe McGurl and, uh, it's like no lunch break. We got yeah. out there real early, <laughs> no lunch break, no nothing, oh just gosh. continuous painting until the sun goes down, you know, starting early in the morning. And uh, it That's was... That's why you need your own car, so you go like, bye. It was actually, it was a good eye opener because he, he's so intense, so if you... you that's not who you go painting with if you want to uh, And then you feel like, wow, I'm really not that productive. There are Man. definitely some artists I go out with. I'm like, okie dokie. Well, I like breaks, apparently. <laughs> Made so. me realize what a lightweight <laughs> I was. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm probably right there. I'm not. I, I'm a pretty, I paint a lot more, I'm sure, than most people. But there are artists who paint way more than me. And I'm just like, where does that energy come from? I am, like, dying here. And you're going out for a midnight painting. I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm going to bed. Good night. Yeah, well, you do need to paint more. <laughs> Well, when you when you come to the um, to the convention, um, you know you can you can get out at four o'clock in the morning and paint the sunrise before art marketing boot camp, and then you can <laughs> uh, you can we do nocturne paintings at night uh, oh, after so the evening though. sessions before you go to bed. So, and and if you want, you can set up a still life in your hotel room. I'm I'm looking. For, I painted. I used to live in San Diego at at the marina we're staying at. I was living part time on a boat there, so I'm kind of, I'm looking forward to going back because they have so many great painting locations around San Diego. So, so what's it's, that it's story? You lived on a boat. Well, I wanted to be in the California Art Club, so I needed residency. So my dad had a sailboat at the Sheraton Marina, so I stayed there. It was very small, and that that at that time I was just plein air painting because there was there was no way there was a studio on that boat. It wasn't that big. So why but, why did you want to uh, be in the California Art Club? Tell us about that. It, they had like a a good mentor program set up, and you know it's kind of a cool club to be a part of. I was like, oh, you know, it was back and I was like, if I could be in the 
21 or 31, if I was in the California Arc, if I got in that gold medal show, I'm going to be somebody. And, you know, you're always setting these little goals for yourself up. But, you know, it was a good club. I think, you know, being a young artist, there were some, they were people who were very accepting. And I think, you know, I came in with, you know, a lot of others. There was like Ariana Richards and I think Jeremy Lipking was kind of new on that scene and Glenn Dean and Logan and Eric Merrill. And it was such a fun group of people. And I think, I don't know, I mean, I can't speak for them, but for me, I felt I got a lot out of being in the club at that age. Like yeah. they made it easier for us. They gave us mentor programs. And, but one of the things is I needed to be in California. So I got my mailing address. I went out there and I was involved as I could be. And they were super helpful. I'm grateful for that. Well, you know, the, the gold medal competition, um, I was talking to Elaine and Peter Adams, who are uh, the, run the club, mm-hmm. and essentially revitalized it after it had yeah. pretty much become just a, an old guard club with uh, not <laughs> much going on. And the they, they said that it was really interesting when they, they got the gold medal up and running again or revitalized. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. Maybe it ran continuously the whole time. But they could see the quality of art elevate year after year because the artist, yeah. would, like yourself, would strive to be in that show and then uh, and, and sometimes didn't get in. But then you, you see the, the works that did mm-hmm. get in and the quality, and you, you strive to get to that level of quality. That's why these art competitions are really, really important. Um, yeah. the online art competitions and so on, because it's, it's not so much about winning the prize. Yes. It's great to win a prize, get your picture on the cover of the magazine. It's great to become a finalist. So you have something on your resume, but the real value in that is driving your, yourself to be better. And yeah, it and, forces the artist to put out the best work they have. Yeah, for show. because so mm-hmm. comparing yourself to others in some ways is, you know, can can be good and bad. But, but really elevating yourself by, you know, striving to be as good as you possibly can be. I think that's really critical. And yeah, those shows are great for it. I agree. I, I know for, you know, there's a show I'm going to be participating in in, in February in Tucson, the the miniature show at Settlers West, and I did so many small paintings for it to get ones that would work for the show. Mm-hmm. And these are just, you know, nine by twelves, and you're trying to make them perfect little nine by twelves. So I, I, I probably painted five or six of them to just do two. Well, what a great but, honor to be in Settlers West too. That's they, the, they, oh, that, that's a great gallery. Like he, he runs it very well. It's a really well run show. So it's like, sometimes just for that reason alone, I want to be a part of it. There's Absolutely. not, you know, it's like a gallery that works well is, is a gem. So it's a, it's a good show. So I, I look forward to it. And then I, I, I will be doing the gold medal show this year. So that next year, next year. So that's exciting. Cause it is at the Autry, which is such a fantastic venue for art. Oh yeah. So that will, hopefully I'll have enough time to go to everything. That's always the hard part. So you are, you're visiting the show, or you have a painting in the show? I have a painting in the show. Oh, so outstanding. Yes. Congratulations. Yes. That's also Thanks. a huge honor. Yeah, so if, if I get in, I'm pretty stoked. So yeah. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we, uh, we kind of get towards wrapping this up, um, what advice uh, can you impart to anyone who is uh, undertaking um, painting and trying to get a little further along. Do you have any, anything specific other than what we've already discussed? Like painting or painting as a career? Well, you tell me. Cause you know, actually I guess it is kind of the same. I'm like painting as a career kind of forces you to become a better painter cause you have to survive, you have to make money and you have to get better. I think it takes, I think for a new artist, the thing they're surprised most by is how much work it takes to be good at painting. It's a round the clock job. You have to paint all the time. If you take a workshop, you go home, you paint more. You don't only paint at classes. It's, it's all the time. You got to get it, the mileage. You do. I mean, you're, that's how you get good. It's not like I took a workshop twice a year. I'm, why am I not good? It doesn't work that way. You have to paint a lot. It is like, you just get those numbers out. Sometimes they're good paintings. Sometimes they're bad paintings. Even if it's just doing stuff that's 
for yourself and for fun, but it, it's more work than I think sometimes people expect and it kind of scares them a bit. And I try to tell them like, that's okay. You will, you know, when I first started painting full time, you know, it might've only been like an hour a day here or there. And then it went to two hours and then to three hours. And eventually I got into the habit of painting, you know, every day, all day, you get used to that, but it's not like right off the bat. Well, the other so. thing that I think is really important is the curve, right? So I remember um, Richard, Richard Lindenberg, the painter, mm -hmm. uh, who also works for, for our magazines in, in the advertising sales. He uh, worked full-time uh, at Sennelier, the uh, paint company, and he was a really mm. good painter at that time. But when that all came to an end and he started painting full-time every day, after about two years, his work took a, a leap that was phenomenal. Yeah. And that th there's just nothing that can replace brush time. Now, there are theories, like we do this, we have this DVD, Brian Mark Taylor, on, on how artists learn. And he has um, really perfected the idea that it's not just about brush time, it's about proper brush time, right? In other yeah. words chunk learning if you want to learn to paint eyes you just do nothing but paint eyes for a while and and master that and then you move on to the next piece of it rather than that. you know than just being all over the map but but that brush time is really critical and you will see uh, a phenomenal difference in your painting if you just put in the time and and it, i can see it, it when i do it's my like magic. I, I have this <laughs> event that I do in the Adirondacks every year, Adirondack Mountains of Upstate New York. And, mm -hmm. you know, I have a job. I run a publishing company and I paint at night when I can. But w when I take people to one of my events, uh, New Zealand or, or Cuba or the Adirondacks or Fall Color Week or whatever, and I paint solid two, three paintings a day for a week, I will, at, by the end of that week, I will see how much better a painter I am because it, yeah. it just is, uh, it's that brush time. Even when we do shows, those plein air shows, you'll notice it too there. Like you're like the first pancake painting and then like by midweek you've really hit your stride. And then by the end of the, the show time, you're so exhausted. You just need a break and then you want to go back at it again. Yeah. So it's, what's it's that normal. like being, uh, for, for somebody who's not been in these, in the show circuit, what's it like? Is it? Is it fun? Is it a lot of work? What's the Super story? fun. Yeah. I have the best time. And if I'm not invited into a show I, it, at that Canyon show, I will still go. I'm like, I will crash it and hang out because it, you know, you wake up early and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm getting up and there's no sun yet. And then you, you eat your cereal and you muster up your coffee and you go out there and you paint and you just kind of hang out with your friends. You joke about the situation. Maybe it's hailing on you. And it doesn't make sense. That's also fun. And then you just paint. You paint with your friends. It's the most beautiful place you can imagine. Most of these shows take place in, you know, gorgeous locations. Like rainy or not, you're pretty happy to be there because you're not in your studio. Yeah. It's also a lot of pressure and a lot of work because you have to make something good. And, you know, all of the artists kind of feel it a little bit. They're, they're, they're worried. Like, am I getting good stuff? How is it going to look on the walls? Will I be up to par with the quality of work in the show and you know sometimes it's hard to judge when you're in that competition at the moment like how well you do sometimes you have to go home but and then think oh I, I did okay <laughs> pressure is good yeah my best plein air works are done at shows you know there's something to be <laughs> there's something to be said for that pressure you know if if you're painting um next to you know cw monday or somebody <laughs> like that <laughs> Don't you, think I've you know, been you, yet. You I feel really like want to up your game, and you, I think you try harder. It's like, here, Amber, you're going to paint next to Richard Schmidt. Good luck. I'm like, can I go home, please? I did paint next go to Richard corner. Schmidt, and it was it was very intimidating. Uh, <laughs> he was very like, gracious. I just not feel it today. I think I'm going to I'm going to sketch. Yeah, I'm going to sketch. <laughs> yeah, very I'm small taking, sketch. I'm taking <laughs> pictures today, Richard. I'm, I'm not going to paint next. Painting to you. in my mind. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, Avery, we you are delightful. You're a lot of fun to be around. Um, I'm oh, looking forward you. to seeing you in San Diego. We'll, oh, we'll it's paint just around the, the scenery corner. of San Diego together. And I think, I'm not entirely sure, but I think your new video will be out by then. 
no, I can't wait to see it. I yeah. hope it looks good. Yeah, well, I, I, the the painting you did for the video was a rock star painting, so it's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, they, I have them here. They look lovely. I'll yeah. have to have to bring them down. No, you have to. You need to send them to me. That's all. I will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Well, well, uh, thank you so much for your time today and for um, inspiring us all. Your work is absolutely beautiful. You're a lot of fun to be around. Um, you have, you know, you have, a, in spite of the fact that you're younger than a lot of us, you have really mm -hmm. proven what can be done. Uh, you know, by starting at 16, uh, <laughs> you've, you've got a lot of years painting under your belt, and it really shows. I mean, your work is is really outstanding, and uh, I'm honored to know you. I appreciate that thought. Thank you. And I, I look forward to seeing you guys soon. It'll be, it'll be a good time. It's always a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again to Amory Bowling. She's a lot of fun. I spent some time with her recently, and we, we had a lot of fun. She likes to laugh a lot. Sponsored by the Plein Air Convention, held this April in San Diego with some of the most amazing artists in the world as faculty to teach you painting, I'll be there teaching you marketing, how to sell paintings. I've got a whole lot of new stuff this year. Whether you're a beginner or just beginning to paint and, or an experienced pro, this is an amazing event. We go outdoors and paint together every day. We have indoor four stages with giant screens so you can see every detail and a giant expo hall of goodies. And everybody sits up at night and talks and laughs and has a good time. And it's a great way to connect and make friends. Uh, you can learn more at the Plein Air Convention plenairconvention.com. Uh, today's interview was sponsored by the Plein Air Salon Art Competition. Again, $15,000 in grand prizes, but lots of over $30,000 in total prizes, including bi-monthly cash prizes. Uh, you'll be seen by top judges. There's over 20 categories and lots of chances to win. And everybody who wins a category is entered into the, uh, the judging for the the last in the end of the year competition. So, and it's just not plein air, it's studio paintings, all kinds of categories. Enter at pleinairsalon.com. Well, the plein air movement is red hot, and that's why, thankfully, plein air magazine is now the number one selling representational art magazine in America. We are so thrilled about that. Sold nationwide at Barnes & Noble. So please drop by, pick one up or get a subscription for about half the price of the newsstand at plenairmagazine.com. Well, this is always fun for me. I like this. Let's do it again sometime. A day with artists is a perfect day as far as I'm concerned. A day without painting, not so great. Anyway, see you next week. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. Remember, it is a great big world out there, and it needs to be painted. We'll see you. Bye-bye.